Welcome to this episode of the OT Dude NBCOT Exam Prep Review. This video will review Parkinson's disease for the NBCOT exam. If you are just watching this on YouTube and not yet enrolled, you'll be missing out on the study guides and quizzes that accompany this topic. It's free to enroll and the links are in the description. I'm Jeff, the OT Dude, and let's get functional. Parkinson's disease PD is a progressive disease that is caused by a dysfunction in the CNS or central nervous system. It is characterized by a dysfunction or a loss of the dopamine producing neurons in the substantia nigra. Another hallmark of Parkinson's disease is the presence of Lewy bodies and protein aggregations in the neurons. As dopamine plays a role with movement, cognition, and emotion, decreased levels of dopamine is associated with movement impairments and many other symptoms. This can lead to a substantially decreased quality of life in people. The cause of PD is unknown, but genetics and environmental factors may play a role. Exposure to environmental factors such as pesticides and repeated head injuries may increase the risk of PD. While the risk of PD is higher when one is over age 50, it can occur in younger people as well. Demographically, PD affects men more than women and certain racial ethnicities, mainly Caucasians. Let's review the symptoms of PD now. The thing to remember for PD when comparing it to other conditions is that PD is thought to be insidious, progressive, and asymmetric as, a, as in physically asymmetric in the onset. In terms of progression and severity, early symptoms are often subtle and progresses gradually. Often they begin in like one side of the body or in one limb. As the disease progresses, then both sides may be affected. However, one side may still be more involved or more severe. To paint a picture of someone with PD, they may experience tremors, making it difficult for transfers, eating, and handwriting. They may speak softly and make slow, small movements. Their face may lack expression or animation. They may have trouble initiating or continuing types of movements. Their gait may be Parkinsonian, which has a forward lean, and they may take small, quick steps with reduced arm swing. Symptoms can be classified as motor and non-motor for PD. Motor symptoms to know and be familiar with and their terminologies include bradykinesia, tremors, cogwheel rigidity, postural instability, impaired balance and coordination, freezing and dystonia. To remember this, when I think about these symptoms, I kind of like visualize a robot, no offense to people with PD. They often move mechanically, right? Robots, which describes the slowness, tremors, impaired coordination, balance with posture and freezing. I also imagine the cog wheels, like as in cog wheel rigidity, as in like the working parts of the robot inside where they have those gears and, and then basically allows them to move. By visualizing a robot, this also helps you to remember the non-motor symptoms as well, actually. These include things like vocal changes, such as softer monotone speech that may be stuttering, diminished vision and slow blinking, which dries the eyes, and a reduced or loss of smell. Can robots smell? Other symptoms can affect someone holistically, and these include cognitive changes, personality changes, fatigue, weight loss, and even poor sleep. Also, GI issues such as constipation, urinary frequency, and sexual issues. Psychosocially, there may be hallucinations, delusions, pain, and susceptibility to anxiety and depression. These symptoms are sometimes described in severity based on the Hohen and Yar scale, which goes from stages 1 least severe to 5, its final stage with complete disability. Notice how in the Hohen and Yar, PD symptoms occur starting from one side of the body. 
Then by stage two, it occurs bilaterally. In stage three, symptoms become more severe and start to affect the gait, like the lower parts of the body. Stage four, you can basically deduce is not quite complete disability in stage five, and it's a little worse than stage three, right? And by process of elimination, just knowing that five is the end of the scale, you wouldn't be able to deduce that it's the most assistance needed for patients. And they actually need total continuous assistance in stage five because they have severe impairment in standing and walking, at least without assistance. Here is a graphical animation to help you remember this too. Notice the figure is divided into kind of like quadrants into also left and right. And starting from the upper and lower body, they're kind of separated too. So this progressed downwards too, right? Towards the lower body. So being not able to walk. So while this is not necessarily the disease progression of the direction of the body, it can help be helpful for you to remember the scale and how it kind of moves from least severe to most severe. In stage one, it starts from one side of the body. Stage two moves to the other side and includes it as well. Stage three, the body and the trunk representing the posture and the balance on the scale and gait is not necessarily affected yet, right? Then by stage four, it goes towards the legs moving inferiorly to represent more impaired walking and standing. Then in stage five, you can include the feet to represent not being able to stand or walk for the scale. To remember the other symptoms, let's point them out graphically on the body as well. The brain for cognitive changes, personality changes such as poor impulse control and psychosocial, the eyes for slow blinking, and diminished movement, also poor sleep, the nose for loss of smell, the mouth for softer affected speech, the arms for coordination and fine motor skills, also cogwheel rigidity, and the chest for posture and balance, the abdomen for GI issues and weight loss, the groin for decreased libido and impotence, but also personality changes such as hypersexuality, and last, the feet for altered gait, needing total assistance at stage five. Medical management for PD includes medications such as L-DOPA, Levodopa, dopamine. See the pattern now? DOPA. Amantadine is another one. MAO inhibitors and also anticholinergics. Amantadine. This is an interesting drug that I have a lot of interest in based on my experience. I have seen amantadine be used for even patients without PD who have low energy, low affect, or low alertness, such as with TBI, become completely the opposite, alert and participatory. It's really, really cool to see that happen. And funny thing is, I researched it now, and I just found out that it's actually primarily used for Parkinson's disease to treat the dyskinesia. So fun fact, amantadine is also one of the most commonly prescribed medications for patients with prolonged disorders of consciousness after a TBI and is also an antiviral. So it was used for this once as well to treat the flu. And antiviral, you may be thinking, perhaps you're thinking maybe COVID. Well, they're looking into that too for the research. I think amantadine is kind of cool because it has these three, four uses and like four personalities or abilities. And that's just pretty amazing from a pharmacological standpoint. So something I appreciate. Anyways, other medical interventions include deep brain stimulation and surgery of the thalamus or the globus pallidus for the affected movement if it becomes very severe, basically. The team that treats PD is made up of physicians, specialists, PT, SLP, which is uh, speech language pathology, OT, psychosocial professionals, nurses, nutritionalists, social workers, and case managers. Outcome measures are pretty intuitive and not unique to Parkinson's, but some examples more specifically for PD include the Parkinson's disease rating scale. We have the modified Barthel index, COPM, activity card sort, quality of life scale, mini mental state exam, caregiver strain index, Beck depression inventory, trails B for driving, and a home assessment for safety and function. So if you're finding this video helpful so far, please give it a thumbs up right now so you can help other students like yourself find my videos easier. 
I would also appreciate it if you also shared this with your friends and study groups. You can also support this channel and my content in other ways, becoming a Patreon member, tipping me in the tip jar, getting some cool OT dude designed stickers, t-shirts, or my very own handmade badge reels to wear as a student or at work. These make great gifts too. Links will be in the description. Now back to our content. Occupational therapy interventions should focus on identifying strategies to help improve people with PD in their ability to participate in valued activities. Also, for them to fulfill their life roles in a client-centered manner. So now you know we aren't just thinking about symptoms and deficits like cogwheel rigidity or freezing when it comes to OT interventions but the big picture and the whole person, right? You wanna have the client use their personal strengths, their environment, and their activity to their advantage. There are seven goals you can address for someone with PD that I have found. One, goal setting. Two, activity analysis and access to services. Three, enhancement of performance. Four, repetition, such as with movement or cognitive even, using external or alternative cues to one's advantage for number five. Number six, using client preferred cues for motor control. And seven, incorporating multimodal activities that are more complex and natural to movement and function rather than just single isolated activities or movements. So you can imagine then that education and coaching would be helpful for clients and caregivers. The environment can also be adapted such as by removing obstacles, rearranging furniture, improving lighting, providing environmental cues, and by optimizing the heights of functional objects and reaching for them. Compensatory strategies can be uses for, can promote movement, planning, and cognition. An example of what I mean is the movement from one, say when they decide to move their finger to actually initiate a movement, it takes cognition, then motor planning, and then last the movement itself, right? So you should wanna be able to Imagine this chain and address all of these factors in the chain of movement. So this will also help you to remember and to emphasize not only to address the typical motor and movement symptoms, but also the cognitive, communicative, sensory, psychosocial, and actual functional activity or leisurely activity, whatever it may be. So remember that stick figure graphic that we reviewed earlier of the body-wide symptoms? So keep this in mind because as OT, we do the occupations and are holistic. But exercise and home programs can also be helpful for movement practice and strategy training. Cognitively factors you can directly or indirectly, as in consciously or subtly, address include planning, problem solving, and time management. Motor practice can include mental imagery and dual task training, which can kind of be thought of as multitasking. A good strategy to remember for the NBCOT exam is sequencing. So breaking down complicated steps of movement and simplifying basically to change the frequency or, and or the timing of movements in order for the movement to be achieved. For fine motor, you can use exercise activities or occupations such as handwriting, promote bilateral extremity use. Adaptations and adaptive equipment may include things like adapting with larger handles for toothbrushes, utensils, and even writing instruments like for handwriting. Fall profession should also be an obvious one to address. Also address communication and cognition. And more with communication, you may incorporate things such as mirrors and by making a referral or collaborating with speech language pathology. Energy conservation due to the fatigue also. Here are the things to promote, promote, promote. For PD, promote ADLs, IDLs, leisure, social, work, you know them. Promote basically lifestyle changes and the mental health as well as sexual participation. Driving as well. Mentally, you can incorporate coping strategies and relaxation or CBT. One example of a cool intervention is Tai Chi or dance as it involves one's cognition, memory, attention, executive function, language, sensory, motor skills, all of that. So for all this, PAMs can also be used as well, such as heat, 
don't forget to address pain as well as spasticity, such as using anti-spasticity splints. Last group interventions may also be helpful as well as because it can provide support to these clients as well. So I hope this helps. I'm Jeff, the OT dude. Thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe for more OT content and have a great day.